Eloise, let's walk in the sound of Today's reading comes from the New Testament, Romans chapter 7, verses 1 to 6. Certainly, you will understand what I am about to say, my brothers and sisters, because all of you know about the law. The law was over people only as long as they live. A married woman, for example, is bound by the law to her husband as long as she lives. But if he dies, then she is free from the law that bound her to him. So then, if she lives with another man while her husband is alive, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is legally a free woman and does not commit the adultery if she marries another man. That is how it is with you, my sisters and brothers. As far as the law is concerned, you have also died because you are part of the body of Christ. And now you belong to him who was raised from death in order that we might be useful in the service of God. For when we lived according to our human nature, the sinful days of us served up the law were at work in our bodies, and all we did ended in death. Now, however, we are free from the law because we died to that which once held us prisoners. No longer do we serve in the old ways of the law, but in the new way of the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our reading this morning comes from the book of Romans, chapter 7, verses 14 to 25. It can be found on page 194 in the New Testament. The conflict between us. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, so as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for I don't do what I like to do, but instead I do what I hate. Since what I do is what I want to do, they should agree that the law is right. So I am not really the one who does this thing, rather it is the sin that lives in me. I know that God does not live in me, that is in my human nature. But even though I decide to do good is in me, I am not able to do it. I do not do the good I want to do, instead of doing evil I don't want to do. If I do what I don't want to do, this means that I am no longer the one who does it. Instead, it's a sin that gives me me, so I find that this law is at work. When I want to do what is good, what is evil is the only choice I have. My inner being delights in the law of God, but I see a different law at work in my body. A law that fights against the law, which my mind agrees on. It makes me a prisoner to the law of sin, which is at work in my body. More than a happy man I am, who rescued me from this body, that is taking me to death. Thanks be to God who does this through our Lord Jesus Christ. This then is my condition. On my own I can serve God's law only with my mind, while my human nature serves the law of sin. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, and Martin will now come to speak to us, so let's pray for him before, we, before he speaks. Lord be with Martin as he preaches to us with power and courage and strength through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please turn with me to Romans chapter 7 and hope as well in the Bibles or in your Acts as we continue in our series looking at the book of Romans. Today's reading is for all of us with addictions, things we can't stop doing. As far as I know, I'm not an alcoholic, but I do have plenty of addictions. I know that if I start a package of wine gums, in just a few minutes it will be an empty packet. I know that I have other addictions as well. When I was a boy, I was always asking questions. I was on a bus once with mum and apparently someone said, can't you tell him to shut up? Questions are good. But I know that sometimes I am too keen to want to find out things for myself and I will worry away at a problem so much that on occasion it becomes all-consuming and I have to learn to watch out for the danger signals. My greed for knowledge stands at the door. Which reminds me of the story in Genesis of the eating of the fruit in the Garden of Eden. 
Genesis tells us how God put the first humans, Adam and Eve, in the lush garden, beautiful and fertile, so wonderful that they did not need to work. And God said, be fruitful and multiply, enjoy all the good things, all the wonderful fruits of the trees that I have given you. Just one thing, not that one over there. And of course, what did they do? They ignored all the others and they went to that one over there. They did the one thing they shouldn't have done and it's been downhill ever since. And I am right to be reminded of that story, for that is a key story at the back of Paul's mind here in Romans chapter 7. And already he's hinted to us that he's going that way, for in chapter 5 he has called, Paul has called me in all my addictions to wrong and to sin, he has called me old Adam. That is the old Adam. God in Christ makes us new, but there is that old Adam against us. And when I see a warmonger on TV breathing anger and violence, and I cry out in condemnation, God's Spirit says back to me, hang on, you're the same family. It's just that you live in comfort in Harlem. And the same meme infects the war zones and me. And my addiction to self is the addiction that leads to war. And this is serious. Sin, evil, is not something to make fun of as Halloween does. It is not trick or treat. It is death or death. As Paul puts it in verse 5, when we lived according to our human nature, the sinful desires stirred up by the law would work in our bodies and all we did ended in death. A UN speaker on Friday said they were losing their trust in human nature. I trust human nature. I trust it to do the very worst it can get away with and then some. And this is what Romans 7 is about. And we acknowledge that we need laws and regulations, but they can and do make things worse. In a, in a previous parish, from time to time we borrowed a portable baptistry and filled it with water for a baptism by immersion. And we would put a heating element into it and it was potentially dangerous. So our sort of equivalent of Tony were worried about this, you see. So I put up a warning sign. Danger, do not touch. Next day, I came into church for our eight o'clock service, and there were our very mature, slightly older members of the congregation putting their hands in. Law and commands just give me ideas of more wrong things to do. Like Adam and Eve, we want to know for ourselves. We won't take it on trust. So we are stupid and we become addicted to whatever it is, from wine gardens to violence. Verses 7 and 8. Shall we say that the law is sinful? Of course not. We need it. But it's the law that makes us know what sin is. If the law had not said, do not desire what belongs to someone else, I would not have known such a desire. But by means of that commandment, sin found its chance to stir up all kinds of selfish desires in me. Wet paint, do not touch. You had thought of touching it until you saw that sign, but you see the sign and you go across and you try it. And we really have eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We get a very good dose from the daily news. And it is to people who wrestled with exactly the issues we wrestle with that Paul wrote Romans. 
he was writing amongst his congregation were slaves. So he was writing to those who were abused. He was writing to those who had been enslaved in war zones. He is writing to those who have seen their family butchered. And they knew what Paul meant when he said, all we did ended in death. And Paul, who himself has led a sort of a death squad trying to kill those of another Christian, of another tradition, in verses 21 and 25, he writes this. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self. But I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That big George preached to us on laments the other month. And I think this is the big lament, chapter 7, in the New Testament. And Paul puts his finger on the problem. Rules are not enough. We agree they need to be standards. Across the world, values like the Ten Commandments, or so-called human rights, individual consciences, we all agree that there are standards. We agree on much of what those standards are, though we might vary on some details. They show that you and I are made in the image of God. There is that of God which is in us. There is something in my mind, as there was in that light mind of Paul, and is here in this lament, that yearns, that screams for truth, and for justice, and for mercy. But rules all meet one problem, that if it is a choice between me and someone else, we know by and large who comes first. Me. If I don't look after myself, who else will? And my body and its wants assert itself over my mind. As Paul puts it in verses 22 and 23, my inner being, as it were, my mind, delights in the law of God, but I see a different law at work in my body. The law that fights against the law which my mind approves of. My body has its wants, and so often it overrules my mind. And tick boxes, legislation, laws, none of it can address this. Who, what can deliver me from my addiction to self? Who, what can write these standards which are in my mind so deeply into my whole being, into my heart, that I really do fulfil them as Jeremiah and Ezekiel longed in their books in the Hebrew Scriptures? Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death I need a heart transplant. And more than that, the world needs a heart transplant. Is this not writ large in the Middle East where the irreconcilables wrestle down the years? Who will deliver me? Who will rescue us? I don't know if anyone listening has had a heart transplant. Several here may well have had heart surgery. Either way, a heart transplant is a major operation and takes lots of preparation. It may be that we've got some here who have been involved in just such surgery. I'm seeing some. It takes a lot of preparation. And God is preparing all of creation for heart surgery. And one day the beloved physician, Christ, 
shall return to this world and we shall all be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And Paul comes to that in chapter 8. And the surgery will be complete rather quicker than even our best surgeons can manage. And God is preparing all of creation, you, me, us all, for that moment. All of history is in God's hands. Sin has its devastating work in our world, and don't we know it? We are not nice, the big heresy of Western Europe. But we trust, we await the arrival of the great physician who will restore all things. And for him we wait. And Christ towers in the wings. And we sense his hand on the door as it creaks. And the theatre of his work is being prepared. And today we cry out not only in our own lives, but in the whole world. Who will deliver us? And God is preparing all of the world for the surgery. And we are discovering how much we need it. How much we need the return of Christ. Our news programs are a meditation on Romans chapter 7. In the meantime, one by one, we make this truth our own and discover God's deliverance. And one by one, we prepare ourselves for that great surgery when we shall not only receive new hearts, but also new bodies, so that our bodies themselves are in touch with our minds and our desires, and the lament of chapter 7 is overcome, and there will be no more pain or suffering or death in God's eternity. One such person is Earl Smith. Earl is the cousin of Fred Smith who started Federal Express and made an absolute fortune. And even Earl was wealthy, in fact, far too wealthy. He was so wealthy he didn't need to work. He took to drugs. In fact, he took to such hard drugs that he ended up at the age of 30 in hospital. And while he was in hospital, someone came to visit him and gave him a New Testament. He was thrilled because the paper in his New Testament was perfect for rolling joints. And he tore out one by one, all his way through Matthew, then he tore out all his way through Mark, and then he tore out and rolled his way all through Luke. But when he got to John's Gospel, he thought, well, perhaps I should try reading it. And as a result of reading John's Gospel, he came to faith in Christ and became a Christian. He was being looked after by a rather beautiful psychologist called Tommy. She was also highly intelligent and had endless degrees. And she looked at Earl and said, Look, I don't understand it. Your life is a complete mess and you have this peace about you. She said, I have everything. I've got good looks. I've got intelligence. I've got fantastic job. My life is totally sordid, and yet, inside, I feel totally empty. So Earl well, led her to Jesus Christ, and they got married. Through reading John's Gospel, Earl met with Jesus, who delivered him. And in Christ, that deliverance is there for each. The whole of creation awaits it, one by one, we prepare for that and turn to Christ. And when I am tempted and turn to Christ, when I know that battle raging within me, when I turn to Jesus, I am not confronted by a set of rules and regulations that simply make me feel more guilty and worse. I meet with Jesus who reminds me I am loved by God in all my addiction. 
I am met by Jesus who reminds me that what really matters is other people. I am met by Jesus who reminds me that my happiness is in practice found in other people. I am met by Jesus who reminds me that my selfishness and addictions will not make it through death to eternity, so why not now start investing in eternal jewels? And I am reminded that Jesus gave his all for me on the cross, and in the resurrection shows and showed his power over all things. And so Jesus wins my heart. And the law is no longer something that I slavishly tick boxes on. My obedience comes from the heart, from Jesus, and learning to love others. And the law becomes, yes, a body of wisdom to learn from. But one learns that it is advice and, as it were, is situated in particular places and particular people and we need to listen to the whole body and learn from the wisdom of it and do our theological work if we are looking to the scriptures, for example. Who will deliver me from this body of death, says Paul. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Today, will you say yes to the great surgeon, the great, the good physician, that Christ might begin writing God's laws in your hearts, not that we might sin, but that we obey and follow the ways of Jesus from our hearts that have been won by Jesus, the law written into our hearts. For that is the obedience we long for. That is what Paul is struggling with. My mind calls for what he's got, but my body does something else. But in Jesus, God wins over all that we are, little by little, bit by bit. And we wait that great transplant for all of creation when all things will become new. Such people and such people alone are on the right side of history. For we know who holds the future. The future is in Christ's hands. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. And I will use a prayer which is an opportunity for us to recommit ourselves to Christ or to do so for the first time. And if you say this prayer for the first time, just let me know after the service and I'll give you a little booklet to help you follow Jesus. Lord Jesus Christ, I am sorry for the things I have done wrong in my life. Please forgive me. I turn from everything that I know is wrong. Thank you that you died on the cross for me so that I could be forgiven and set free. Thank you that you offer me forgiveness and the gift of your Spirit to write your laws on my heart. I receive the gift of your presence. Emmanuel, God with us, your Holy Spirit. Please come into my life by your Holy Spirit and make yourself known to me now and forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.